That is bright. And slightly. We'll just have to work with this because my setup sucks. I'm not so bad. I'm not at my studio. We'll just see uh, who decides to file in, but whoever uh, is here, can you hear me? We shall see if anyone wants to show up for this madness. And this is me inviting people. And hoping that, oh, my fingers, my hand. If any of you are into palmistry, my palms are terrible. Like, seriously, my palms are terrible. According to the experts. But we're going to get into that. We're going to get into why my palms are so terrible and um, things like that. It's going to be funny. And you'll have to forgive me for the next couple minutes because I, I started some... Uh, BS on Facebook, and that was awesome. What is this? I got a message. Yeah. Oh, hey. Hi there. How are you? I'm a I'm a start in a few minutes. I'm going to give some people a chance to uh, file in over the next couple minutes because yeah, I'm not I'm not really great at this live stream stuff because I've uh, I mean I've been interviewed twice. I've been interviewed by the Kurgan, who is an am he's an amusing fellow. And then I've been interviewed by Nick Rikita, who is also an amusing fellow, but that was like a more professional interview and 
I'm kind of, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just a little bit bad at it. So I'm going to give people a couple minutes to file in, and hopefully some people do. If not, screw it, then I'll read anyway, and it'll be future content that people can review. And that's fine. And yeah, I'm probably gonna um, probably gonna smoke at some point because yeah, my brain works better on nicotine, and that's great. But it's not really. I actually actively discourage uh, smoking or pretty much any kind of drug use, except for caffeine, maybe. Like, I don't know. It's just weird. But all right. Let's try and get some people in here and then we'll really, truly get started. Even if nobody else shows up, because then, hey, it's content for my, uh, my YouTube. And this is me being bad at typing. Pretty fantastic. And hey, can you hear me okay? I mean, I don't know. There are three people. Yay. Michelle tells me it sounds good. And that's great. I, I, I set up my fancy mic. That's why my camera angle, angle is a little weird because I've got this, uh, like the webcam mic is at the bottom left-hand side of my screen. My mic is over here, and it's just, it's weird. It's weird and annoying. <clears throat> we'll give it a few more minutes and really let it file in, or let people get a chance to file in. But um, as far as Charles Williams goes, like, he is vastly underrated as an author because you know you have c.s lewis you have j.r.r tolkien they were all in this group of writers called the inklings and um writerly groups tend to um i mean even the best of writerly groups tend to have tend to devolve into weird cliques. But the thing about Williams was that he wasn't like a traditional, oh, I was raised Catholic, or I was raised Protestant, then became Catholic because I'm C.S. Lewis or whatever. 
that wasn't Charles Williams. Charles Williams was an occultist. He was friends with Virginia Woolf. And um, if you have ever taken a halfway decent English course, then you're familiar with Virginia Woolf. And, um, and I'm going to um a lot because I'm bad at live streaming. But, uh, but yeah, you have, he's BFF with Virginia Woolf, who is one of the uber feminist authors of her day. And then with his influence from Tolkien and Lewis, he's like, oh, you know, I've got this all bass backwards. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a Christian. I'm going to. Um, I don't remember if he became a Catholic or what. I think he was a Protestant, and that's okay. I, I don't hate on alternative denominations. I'm, I'm mostly Orthodox, except that I'm not like fully Orthodox. So that kind of weirds people out sometimes. But it's the pandemic and I have health problems that prevent me from going from to my uh, to my closest uh, church to be fully catechized. And God understands the intent of my heart. So I'm working on it. And I spent a long time in the wilderness the way Charles Williams spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And that's that's part of what endears me so much to him. It's just like he has so much humanity to him. It's kind of painful to read at times, but it's good. But um, Charles Williams, the forgotten inkling. Everybody remembers C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, and they forget that Williams was part of their group. They'd go out, they'd go to their uh, alcohol-fueled, um, parties at the end and that's great they did what writers do they talked about their stories they had a good time of it and I just I just I've always thought that Williams got the short end of the stick and I had to parry parody him mercilessly in the Darwin delusion when I wrote that because I was for a time myself into that kind of thing like you know okay I believe in things like astral projection and certain occult things and i highly discourage and i can't stress this enough i highly discourage people to uh go into that shit but it's real and it's there and you know some people are gonna do what they're gonna do and some people are gonna touch the stove and i'm one of those people i'm 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 the kind of guy who touches the stove and that's all there is to it. But, um, yeah. In any case, I'm not going to read T.S. Eliot's introduction to you this evening, although his introduction is excellent. And it's almost worth the price of, of admission to the uh, book itself. 
but this is All Hallows Eve by Charles Williams. Chapter One, The New Life. She was standing on Westminster Bridge. It was twilight, but the city was no longer dark. The street lamps along the embankment were still dimmed, but in the buildings, shutters and blinds and curtains had been removed or left undrawn. And the lights were coming out of there like the first faint stars above. Those lights were, <clears throat> pardon, those lights were the peace. It was true that formal peace was not yet in being. All that had happened was that fighting had ceased. The enemy as enemy no longer existed. And one more crisis of agony was done. Labor, intelligence, patience, much need for these, and much certainty of boredom and suffering and misery, but no longer the sick vigils and daily despair. Lester Furnival stood and looked at the city while the twilight deepened. The devastated areas were hidden. Much was to be done, but could be. In the distance, she could hear an occasional plane. It's its sound gave her a greater sense of relief than the silence. It was precisely not dangerous. It promised a truer safety than all the squadrons of fighters and bombers of hell. Something was ended in those remote engines told her so. The moon was not yet risen. The river was dark below. She put her hand on the parapet and looked at it. It should make no more bandages if she could help it. It was not a bad hand, though it was neither so clean nor so smooth. Oh my God, sticky pages. As it had been years ago, before the war. It was 25 now, and to her that seemed a great age. She went on looking at it for a long while, in the silence and the peace, until it occurred to her that the silence was very prolonged, except for that recurrent solitary plane. No one, all the time she had been standing there, had crossed the bridge. No voice, no step, no car had sounded in the deepening night. She took her hand off the wall and turned. The bridge was as empty as the river. No vehicles or pedestrians here, no craft there. In all that city, she might have been the only living thing. She might have been so impressed by the sense of security and peace while she had been looking down at the river that only now, she, that only now did she begin to try and remember why she was there on the bridge. There was a confused sense in her mind that she was on her way somewhere. She was either going to or coming from her own flat. It might have been to meet Richard, though she had an idea that Richard, or someone with Richard, had told her not to come. But she could not think of anyone except Richard, who was at all likely to do so, and anyhow she knew she had been determined to come. It was all mixed up with that crash which had put everything out of her head. And as she lifted her eyes, she saw beyond the houses and the abbey, the cause of the crash, the plane lying half in the river and half on the embankment. She looked at it with a sense of importance to her, but she could not tell why it should seem so important. Her only immediate concern with it seemed to be that it might have blocked the direct road home to her flat, which lay beyond Millbank and where and was where Richard was or would be and her own chief affairs. She thought of it with pleasure. It was reasonably new and fresh, and they had been lucky to get it when Richard and she had been married yesterday. At least yesterday? Well, not yesterday, but not very much longer than yesterday. Only the other day. It had been the other day. The word for a moment worried her. It had been indeed another separate day. She felt as if she had almost lost her memory of it. Yet she knew she had not. She had been 
married, she had been <clears throat> pardoned. She had been married and to Richard. The plain in the thickening darkness was now but a thicker darkness and indistinguishable only because her eyes were still fixed on it. If she moved, she would lose it. If she lost it, she would be left in the midst of this. If she lost it, she would be left in the midst of the lull. She knew the sudden London lulls well enough, but this lull was lasting absurdly long. All the lulls which she had ever known were not as deep as this, in which there seemed no movement at all, as if the gentle agitation of the now visible stars were less than movement, or the steady flow of the river beneath her. She had at least seen that flowing, or had she? Was that also still? Was she also alone with this night in the city, a night of peace, and a night of the stars, and of bridges, and of the streets she knew, but all in a silence she did not know, that, she, that if she yielded to the silence, she would not know these other things, and the whole place would be different and dreadful? She stood up from the parapet against which she had been leaning and shook herself impatiently. I'm moithering, she said in a word she had picked up from her Red Cross companion and took a step forward. If she could not get directly along the mill bank, she must now go round. Fortunately, the city was at least partially lit now. The lights in the houses shone out and by them she could see more clearly than, than in the battle days. But also she, she could see into them. And somewhere in her there was a small desire to see someone, a woman reading, children playing, a man listening to the wireless, something of that humanity which must be near, but of which on that lonely bridge she could feel nothing. She turned her faith she turned her face towards Westminster and began to walk. Sorry, my lips get dry. It's the diabetes. She had hardly taken a dozen steps when she stopped. In the first moment, she thought it was only the echo of her own steps that she heard. But immediately she knew it was not. Someone else at last was there. Someone else was coming and coming quickly. Her heart leaped and subsided. The sound at once delighted and frightened her. But she grew angry with this sort, with this sort of dallying, this overconsciousness of sensation. It was more like Richard than herself. Richard could be aware of sensations, so, and yet take it in its stride. It was apt to distract her. She had admired him for it, and still did, but only now was she a little envious and irritated. She blamed Richard for her own incapacity. She had paused, and before she could go on, she knew the steps. They were his. Six months of marriage had not diluted the recognition. She knew the true time of it at once. It was Richard himself coming. She was quickly on. In a few moments, she saw him. Her eyes as well as her ears recognized him. Her relief increased her anger. Why had he let her in for this inconvenience? Had they arranged to meet? If so, why had he not been there? Why had she been kept waiting? And what had she been doing while she had been kept? The lingering lack of memory drove her on and increased her irritation. He was coming. His fair bare head shone dark gold under a farther street lamp under the nearer they came face to face. He stopped dead as he saw her and his face went white. Then he sprang towards her. She threw up her hand as if to keep him off. She said with a coldness, with a coldness against her deeper will, 
but she could not help it. Where have you been? What have you been doing? I've been waiting. He said, how did you get out? What, did, what do you mean, waiting? The question startled her. She stared at him. His own gaze was troubled and almost inimical. There was something in him which scared her more. She wondered if she was going to faint, for he seemed almost to float before her in the air and be far away. She said, what do you mean? Where are you going, Richard? For he was going in another sense. Her hand still raised in that repelling gesture. She saw him move backwards, uncertainly, out of range of that dimmed light. She went after him. She could not, he could not evade her. She was almost up to him, and she saw him throw out his hands towards her. She caught them. She knew she caught them because she knew she could see them in her own, but she could not feel them. They were terrified, and he was terrified. She brought her hands against her breast, and they grew fixed there as wide-eyed with anger and fear. She watched him disappearing before her. As if he were a ghost, he faded, and with him faded all the pleasant human sounds, feet, voices, bells, engines, wheels, which now she knew that while she had talked to him, she again clearly heard. She had gone, all was silent. She choked on his name. It did not recall him. He had vanished and she stood once more alone. She could not tell how long she stood there, shocked and impotent to move. Her fear was at first part of her rage, but presently it separated itself and was cold in her and became a single definite thought. When at last she could move, could step again to the parapet and lean against it and rest her hands on it, the thought possessed her with desolation. It dominated everything, anger and perplexity and the silence. It was in a word dead she thought dead he could not otherwise have gone never in all their quarrels had he gone or she that certainty had allowed them a license that they dared not otherwise have risked she began to cry unusually helplessly stupidly she felt the tears on her face and peered at the parapet for a handbag and a handkerchief since now she could not, oh, despair, borrow his, as with her most blasting taunts she had sometimes done. It was not on the parapet. She took a step or two away, brushed with her hands the tears from her eyes, and looked about the pavement. It was not on the pavement. She was crying in the street, and she had ne neither handkerchief nor powder, this was what happened when Richard was gone, was dead. He must be dead. How else could he be gone? How else could she be there? How, pardon me. How else should she be there? And so, dead, and she had done it once too often. Dead, and this had been their parting. Dead, her misery swamped her penitence. They had told each other it made no difference, and now it had made this. They had reassured each other in their re reconciliations, for they had been fools and quick-tempered, high egotists and bitter of tongue. They had been much in love, and they had been fighting their way. But she felt her own inner mind and had always foreboded this. Dead. Separate. Forever separate. It did not in that separation, much matter who was dead, if it had been she, she. On the instant she knew it, the word still meant to her only so much as the separation that the knowledge did not at first surprise her. One of them was she. Very well she was, but then she was. On that apparent bridge, beneath those apparent stars, she stood up and knew it. Her tears stopped and dried. 
she felt the stiffness and the stains on her apparent flesh. She did not now doubt the fact that she was not surprised. She remembered what had happened, herself setting out to meet Evelyn at the tube, and instead coming across her just over there, and there stopping. And then the sudden loud noise, the shrieks, the violent pain. The plane had crashed on them. She had then, or very soon after, become what she now was. Pardon me. She was no longer crying. Her misery had frozen. The separation she endured was deeper than even she had believed. She had seen Richard for the last time, for now she herself was away, away beyond him. She was entirely cut off. She was dead. It was now a more foreign word than it had ever been, and it meant this. She could, perhaps, if it was he who had not if it was he who had been dead, have gone back to him. Now she could not. She could never get back to him. And he would never come to her. Pardon. It was all quite proper. Quite inevitable. She had pushed him away. And there was an end to Richard. But there was no end to her. Never in her life had she contemplated so final an end which was no end. All change had carried some final kind of memory which was encouragement. She was always supposed to be... And it was so. She had told herself when she left school, when she was married, that she was facing a new life. But she had, on the whole, been fortunate in her passage, and some pleasantness in her past had always offered her a promise in the future. This, however, was quite a new life. Her good fortune had preserved her from any experience of that state, which is almost adequately called death in life. It had consequently little prepared for her the it had consequently little prepared her for this life in death. Her heart had not fallen ever, ever through an unfathomed emptiness, supported only on the fluttering wings of everyday life, and not even realizing that it was supported. She was quite an ordinary and rather lucky girl, and she was dead. Only the city laid silently around her and only the river flowed below and the stars flickered above and in the houses lights shone it occurred to her presently to one <clears throat> pardon me it occurred to her presently to wonder vaguely as in hopeless affliction men do wonder why the lights were shining if the city were as empty as it seemed there was no companion anywhere. Why the lights? She gazed at them, and the wonder flickered and went away. And after a while, returned and presently went away again, and so on for a long time. She remained standing there, for though she had been reasonably intelligent and a forceful creature, she had never in fact had to display any initiative, much less such initiative as was needed here. She had never much thought about death. She had never prepared for it. She n had never related anything to it. She had never, she, she had nothing whatever to offer to it, except this wide prospect of London in which she remained hopeless. She knew it was a wide prospect for after she had remained for a great while in the dark, it had grown slowly light again. A kind of pale October day had dawned, and the kinds 
of lights in the apparent houses had gone out and it had once more grown dark and they had shone and so on 20 or 30 times. There had been no sun. During the day, she saw the river and the city. During the night, the stars, nothing else. Why at last she began to move, she could not have said. She was not hungry or thirsty or cold or tired. Well, perhaps a little cold and tired, but only a little, and certainly not hungry or thirsty. But if Richard, in this new sense, were not coming, it presently seemed to her useless to wait. But besides Richard, the only thing in which she had been interested had been the apparatus of which she had been interested in mortal life, not people. She had not cared for people particularly, except perhaps Evelyn. She was, she was sincerely used to Evelyn, whom she had known at school and since, but apart from Evelyn, not people, only things they used and lived in. Houses, dresses, furniture, gadgets of all kinds. That was what she had liked. And if she had wanted it now, that was what she had got. She, of course, knew this. And if she could not know that it was the sincerity of her interest that procured her this relaxation in the void. If Richard had died, this would have remained vivid to her. Since she was dead, it remained also, though not stripped of all forms of men and women, particularly vivid. She began to walk. It did not matter which way. Her first conscious movement, and even that hardly a movement of volition, was to look over her shoulder in the seeming daylight to see if the plane were there. It was, though dimmer and smaller as if it were fading. Would the whole city gradually fade and leave her to emptiness? Or would she too fade? She did not really attempt to grapple with the problem of her seeming body. Death did not offer her problems of that sort. Her body and life had never been a problem. She had accepted it, inconveniences and all, as a thing that simply was. Her pride, and she had a good deal of pride, especially sexual, had kept her from commitments except with Richard. It was her willingness to commit herself with Richard that made her believe she, as she called it, loved Richard. Though in her bad moments, she definitely wished Richard was, in that sense, to love her more than she loved him. But, it, but, <clears throat> pardon, but her bad moments were not many. She really did want and need and, so far, love Richard. And longing and despair and self-blame were, sin were sincere enough. And they did not surprise her. It had been plain, honest passion. And plain, honest passion it remained. But now the passion more and more took the form of one thought. She had done it again. She had done it once too often. And this was the unalterable result. She began to walk. She went up northward. That was instinct. She at least knew that part of London. Up from the bridge, up Whitehall, no one. In Tra Trafalgar Square, no one. Into the shops, into the offices, no one. They were all full and furnished with everything but man. At moments, she, as she walked, a horrible fancy took to her that those at which she was not at the moment looking were completely empty. That everything was but walked straight through one of those shops. She would come into the entire nothing. It was a creeping sensation of the void. She herself could not have put it into words, but there the suspicion was. She came up to the bottom of Charing Cross Road and began to go up it. 
In front of her, she saw the curtains of the brick that hid the entrances of Leicester Square Tube Station. By one of them, on the opposite side of the road, someone was standing. She was still not conscious of any shock, of surprise, or fear, or even relief. Her emotions were not in action. There had been no one. There was now someone. It was not Richard. It was another young woman. She crossed the roads towards the unknown. It seemed the thing to do. Unknown? Not unknown. It was. And now she did feel a faint surprise. It was Evelyn. In the sudden recollection of having arranged to meet Evelyn there, she almost forgot that she was dead. But then she remembered that their actual meeting had been ac accidental. They had both happened to be on their way to their appointed place. As she remembered, she felt a sudden renewal of the pain and of the oblivion. It did not remain. There was nothing to go but on. She went on. The figure of Evelyn moved and came towards her. The sound of her heels was at first hideously loud on the pavement as she came. But after a step or two, it dwindled to almost nothing. Lester hardly noticed the noise at the time or its diminution. Her sense was in her eyes. She absorbed the approaching form as it neared her with a growing intensity which caused her almost to forget Richard. The second best was now only the best. As they drew together, she could not find anything to say but beyond what she had said a hundred times, dull and carelessly. Oh, hello, Evelyn. The sounds of the words scared her, but much more the immediate intolerable anxiety about the reply. Would it come? It did come. The shape of her friend said in a shaking voice, Oh, hello, Lester. They stopped and looked at each other. Lester could not find it possible to speak of their present state. Evelyn stood before her, a little shorter than she, with her rather pinched face and a quick glancing black eyes. Her black hair was covered by a small green hat. She wore a green coat, and her hands were fidgeting with each other. Lester saw at once that she was also without a handbag. This lack of what? For both of them was almost if not quite part of their very dress something without which they were never seen in public this loss of handkerchief compact keys money letters left them particularly de desolate they had nothing but themselves and what they wore no property no convenience Lester felt nervous of the loss of her dress itself. She clutched it defensively. Without her handbag, she was doubly forlorn in this empty city. But Evelyn was there, and Evelyn was something. They could, each of them, whatever was to happen, meet it with something human close by. Poor, disordered, Poor deserted vagrants as they were, they could at least be companions in their wanderings. She said, so you're here, and felt a little cheered. Perhaps soon she would be able to utter the word death. Lester had no lack of courage. She had always been willing, as it is called, to face facts. Indeed, her chief danger had been that. In a life with no particular crisis and no particular meaning, she would invent for herself facts to face. She had the common vague idea of her age that if your sexual life were all right, you were all right. And she had the common vague idea of all ages that if you and your sexual life were not all right, it was probably someone else's fault, Pro perhaps undeliberate, but still their fault. Her irritation with her husband had been much more the result of power-seeking material than mere fretfulness. 
Her courage and her power when she saw Evelyn stirred. She had prepared a part for them to play. Frankness, exploration, daring. Oh, if it could but have been with Richard. Evelyn was speaking. Her quick and yet inaccurate voice rippled in words and slurred them. She said, you have been a long time. I quite thought you wouldn't be coming. I've been waiting. You can't think how long. Let's go into the park and sit down. Lester was about to ask, answer when she was appalled by the mere flat ordinariness of the words. She had been gripping to herself so long her final laws of Richard that she had gripped also the new state in which they were. This talk of sitting down in the park came over her like a nightmare, with a nightmare's horror of unreality become actual. She saw before her the pardon. She saw before her the entrance to the station, and she remembered they had meant to go somewhere by tube. She began with an equal idiocy to say, but weren't we? When Evelyn gripped her arm, Lester disliked being held. She disliked Evelyn holding her. Now she disliked it more than ever. Her flesh shrank. Her eyes were on the station entrance and the repulsion of her flesh spread. There was the entrance. They had meant to go, yes, but there could not now be any tube below, or it would be as empty as the street. A medieval would have feared other things in such a moment. The way, perhaps, to the Cita de Linte, or the people of it, or smooth, or hairy, tusked, or clawed, malicious, or lustful, creeping and clambering up from the lower depths. She did not think of that, but she did think of the spaces and what might fill them. What but the dead? Perhaps, in a flash, she saw them. Perhaps there were the people, the dead people of this empty city were. Perhaps that was where the whole population had been lying, waiting for her too. The entrance waiting, and all below the entrance, there were the things her courage could not face. Evelyn's clutch on her arm was light, light out of all proportion to the fear in Evelyn's eyes. But in her own fear, she yielded to it. She allowed herself to be led away. They went into the park. They found a seat and sat down. Evelyn had begun to talk, and now she went on. Lester had always known Evelyn talked a good deal, but she had never listened to more than what she chose. Now she could not help listening, and she had never before heard Evelyn gabble like this. The voice was small and thin, as it usually was, but it was speedier and much more continuous. It was like a river. No, it was like something thrown about on a river, twisted and tossed. It had no pressure, it had no weight, but it went on. She was saying that we shouldn't go to see it today after all. I mean, there aren't many people about, and I do hate an empty theater, don't you? Even a cinema. I will, it always seems different. I hate not being with people. Should we go and see Betty? I know you don't much care for Betty or her mother. I don't like her mother myself. But of course, with Betty, she must have had a very difficult time. I wish I could have done more for her, but I tried. I'm really very fond of Betty, and I've always said there was some very simple explanation for that odd business with the, gen with the little German refugee a year or two ago. Naturally, I never said anything to her about it, because she's always morbidly shy, isn't she? I did hear his name. Drayton. He's a friend of your husband, isn't he? But I think he... Lester said, if she said, she was not certain. But she seemed to say, be quiet, Evelyn. The voice stopped. Lester knew that she had stopped it. She could not herself say more. 
the stillness of the city was immediately present again, and for a moment she almost regretted her words. But of the two she knew she preferred the immense, the inimical, the inimical stillness to that insensate babble. Death as death was preferable to death mimicking a foolish life. She sat almost defiantly silent. They both sat silent. Presently, Lester heard her by her side, a small and curious noise. She looked around. Evelyn was sitting there crying as Evelyn had, or as Lester had cried. The tears running down her face and the small noise came from her mouth. She was shaking all over and her teeth were knocking together. That was the noise. Lester looked at her. Once she would have been impatient or sympathetic. She felt that even now she must be either, but in fact she was neither. There was Evelyn crying and chattering. Well, there was Evelyn crying and chattering. It was not a matter that seemed relevant. She looked away again. They went on sitting. The first shadow of another night was in the sky. There was never any sun, so it could, so it could not sink. There was a moon, but a moon of some difference, for given no light. It was large and bright and cold, and it hung in the sky, but there was no moonlight on the ground. The lights in the houses would come on and then go out. It was certainly growing darker. By her side, the chattering went on. The crying became more full of despair. Lester dimly remembered that she would once have been as irritated by it all, as all, but the truly compassionate always are by misery. Now she was not. She said nothing. She did nothing. She could not help being aware of Evelyn and a slow recollection of her past with Evelyn forced itself into her mind. She knew she had never really liked Evelyn, but Evelyn had been a habit, almost a drug, with which she has filled spare hours. Evelyn usually did what Lester wanted. She would talk gossip, which Lester did not quite like to talk, but did rather like to hear talked, because she could then listen to it while despising it. She kept Lester up to date on her less decent curiosities. She came because she was invited and stayed because she was needed. They went out together because it suited them. They'd been going out that afternoon because it suited them. And now they were dead and sitting in the park because it suited someone or something else. Someone who had let a weakness into a plane or had not been able to manage the plane or perhaps the city of facades in which a mere magnetic emptiness had drawn them to be there, just there. Still motionlessly gazing across the darkening heart, Lester thought again of Richard. If Richard had been in distress by her side, not, of course, crying and chattering, more likely dumb and rigid, would she have done anything? She thought probably not, but she might. She certainly might have cried to him. She would have expected him to help her, but she could not think of it. The pain took her quickly, but he was not there and could not be. Well, the pain continued, but she was growing used to it. She knew she would have to get used to it. The voice by her side spoke again. It said through its sobs, the sobs catching and interrupting it. Lester, Lester, I'm so frightened. And then again, Lester, why won't you let me talk? Lester began, why? And had to pause, for in the shadow her voice was dreadful. 
It does not sound like a voice, only like an echo. In the apparent daylight, it had not been so bad, but in this twilight, it seemed only like something that, if it were happening at all, it were happening elsewhere. It could not hold any meaning, for all meaning had been left behind. In her flat perhaps, which she would never occupy again, or perhaps with the other dead in the tunnels of the two, or perhaps further away yet, with whatever it was that had drawn them there and would draw them farther, this was only a little way. Oh, what else remained to know? She paused, but she would not be defeated. She forced herself to speak. She could and would dare at that least. At that at least. She said, why? Why do you want to talk now? The other voice said, I can't help it. It's getting so dark. Let's go on talking. We can't do anything else. Lester felt again the small, weak hand on her arm, and now she had time to feel it. Nothing else intervened. She hated the content. Evelyn's hand might have been the hand of some pleading lover whose touch made her flesh creep. She had, once or twice in her proud life, been caught like that. Once in a taxi, the present touch brought sharply back that other clasp in this very park on a summer evening she had only not she had only just not snapped on a summer snapped into irritation and resentment then but in some ways she had liked the unfortunate man and they had been dining pleasantly enough she had remained kind. She had endured the fingers feeling up her wrist, her whole body loathing them, until she could, with sufficient decency, disengage herself, until she was with sufficient... It was her first conscious rec recollection of an incident in her, pan in her past that act of pure courtesy. Though she did not then recognize it either as a recollection or courtesy. Only for a moment, she thought she saw a taxi race through the park away before her, and she thought it could not be and was not. But she stiffened herself now against her instinctive shrinking, and she let her arm lie still while the foot feeble hand clutched and pawed at her. Her apprehension quickened as she did so. To be what she was in this state of death was bad enough. But at the same time, to feel the dead, to endure the clinging of the dead, being dead, to know the dead. The live man in the taxi was better than this. This that was Evelyn, the gabbing voice, the chattering teeth the helpless sobs, the crawling fingers. But she had gone out with Evelyn much more than with the man in the taxi. Her heart acknowledged a death. She continued to sit still. She said in a voice touched by pity, if not by compassion, it's no good talking, especially like that. Don't you understand? We don't know much longer. But I'm very tired. It's been a long week. And uh, Mr. Charles Williams is great. Evelyn answered, resentfully choking, but still holding on. I was only telling you about Betty, and it's all quite true. And no one can hear me except you, so it doesn't matter. No one could hear. It was true enough. Unless indeed the city heard. Unless the distant facades and the nearer facade of trees and grass were listening. And uh, the thin nothingness 
could perhaps hear and know. Lester felt all about her strange attention, and Evelyn herself, as if frightened by her own words, gave a hasty look around and then burst again into a hysterical monologue. Isn't it funny? We're all alone. We never thought we'd be alone in like this, did we? But I only said what was quite true, even if I do hate you. I'm very fond of you. You won't go away, will you? It's nearly dark again, and I hate when it's dark. You don't know what the dark was like before you came. Why are we here like this? I haven't done anything. I haven't. I tell you I haven't. I haven't done anything. The last word rose like a wail in the night, almost as in the old tales, as if a protesting ghost was loosed and fret, as if a protesting ghost was loose and fled in a cry as thin as its own tenuous wisp of existence through the irresponsive air of a dark world where its own justification was its only and worst accusation. So high and shrill was the wail that Lester felt as though Evelyn herself must have been torn away and have vanished, but it was not so. The fingers still clutched her wrist, and Evelyn's still sat there, crying and ejaculating without strength to cry harder. I haven't done anything, anything. I haven't done anything at all. And what then could be done now? If neither Evelyn nor she herself had ever of old done anything, what could or should they do now with nothing and no one about them? With only the shell of a city and they themselves, but shell and perhaps not even true shell. Only a faint memory and a pang worse than memory. It was too much to bear, as if provoked by an ancient impetuous impetuosity of rage. Lester sprang to her feet, shell or body. She sprang up, and the moment tore her from the hand that held her. She took a step away. Better go alone than sit so companion. And then as her foot moved to the second step, she paused. Evelyn had failed again. Oh, don't go, don't go. Lester felt herself again thrusting Richard away, and she paused. She looked back over her shoulder, half in anger and half in pity. In fear and score and tenderness, she looked back. She saw Evelyn. Evelyn instead of Richard. She stared down at the other girl and she exclaimed aloud, Oh my God! It was the kind of casual exclamation she and Richard had been in the habit of throwing about all over the place. It meant nothing. When they were seriously aggressive or aggrieved, they used language borrowed from bestiality or hell. She had never thought it meant anything. But in this air, every, every word meant something, it meant itself. And this curious new exactitude of speech hung there like a strange language, as if she had swung, sworn in Spanish or pushed to. And the oath had echoed in invocation. Nothing now happened. No one came. Not a quiver disturbed the night. But for a moment, she felt as if someone might come, or perhaps not even that. No more than a sudden sense that she was listening as if to hear it, if it was raining. She was becoming strange to herself. Her words, even her intonations, were foreign. In a foreign land, she was speaking, in a foreign tongue. She spoke and did not know what she said. Her mouth was uttering its own habits, but the meaning of those habits was not her own. She did not recognize the words she used, how they talked, and how as a great precise prehistoric maid, she articulated the speech of Adam or Seth or Noah, 
and only dimly recognized the intelligibility of it. She exclaimed again despairingly, Richard, and that word she did know, it was the only word common to her in the city in which she stood. And she spoke, she almost saw his face, himself saying something, and she thought she would have understood the meaning for his face had lived with the meaning, loved, desired, denounced it. Something intelligible and great loomed and was gone. She was silent. She turned. She said more gently than she had spoken before, Evelyn, let's do something now. But I haven't done anything, Evelyn sobbed again. And the precise words sounded round them and lesser, lesser answered than he knew. No, she said, I know, nor have I much. She had for six months kept house for Richard and herself and meant it. She had meant it. Quarrels and bickerings could not alter that. Even the throwing it away could not alter it. She lifted her head. It was certain as any time of stars now above her in the sky. For the second time, she felt, apart from Evelyn, her past present with her. She first had been in the sense of that shadowy taxi racing through the park, but this was stronger and more fixed. She lived more easily for that moment. She said again, not very much, let's go. But where can we go? Evelyn cried. Where are we? It's so horrible. Lester looked around her. She saw the stars. She saw the lights. She saw dim shapes of houses and trees and the landscape, which was less familiar through being so familiar. She could not even yet manage to enunciate her companion the word death. The landscape of death lay around them. The future of death awaited them. Let them go to it. Let them do something. She thought of her own flat and of Richard. No, she did not wish to take this other Evelyn there. Besides, she herself would be, if anything at all, only a dim shadow to Richard, a hallucination or a troubling apparition. She could not bear that if it could be avoided. She could not bear to be only a terrifying room. No, they must go elsewhere. She wondered if Evelyn felt in the same way about her own home. She knew that Evelyn had continuously snubbed and suppressed her mother, with whom she lived. Once or twice she had herself meant to say something, if only out of an indifferent superiority. But now the indifference had but only, <clears throat> pardon, but the indifference had beaten the superiority. It was now for Evelyn to choose. She said, shall we go to your place? Evelyn saw, said shrilly, no, no, I won't see mother. I hate mother. Lester shrugged. One way and another, they did seem to be rather vagrants, unfortunate and helpless creatures with no purpose and no use. She said, well, let's go. Evelyn looked up to her. Lester, with an effort at companionship, tried to smile at her. She did not very well succeed, but at least Evelyn slowly and reluctantly got to her feet. The lights in the houses had gone out, but a faint clarity was in the air. Perhaps, though it had come quickly, the first suggestion of the day. Lester knew exactly what she had better do, and with an effort she did it. She took Evelyn's arm. The two dead girls went slowly together out of the park. And that is chapter one of Charles Williams' All Hallows' Eve. Now that's not my favorite book of his. I um, I strongly prefer the Greater Trumps, but All Hallows Eve 
got him a uh, a review by T.S. Eliot, of whom you might have heard. You know, he uh, wrote that stupid musical about cats. Well, I take that back. He wrote that stupid book of poetry that was adapted into a musical about cats. And if he had been alive, he probably would have, you know, murdered everybody who did that. I get it. This has not been my finest evening. I'm extremely tired. I worked like 70 hours this week. But I usually read that book cover to cover every year on Halloween. This year was not the year for that. But I thought I would share it with you anyway. Because it's a really good story about two dead girls. And um, Charles Williams was the best of pardon. Double part. In my opinion, Charles Williams was the best of the Williams. Like, all right, Tolkien could weave an amazing epic. And then you have C.S. Lewis, and he's like your every man. But Williams Williams came from different stock. Like he was he was way out there. And I like it. Because I've been way out there. I can relate. But I think I'm going to shut this down unless anybody has anything they want to add. I mean, I've been reading three people, and that's fine. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and end this. We'll, uh, we'll do something else special later. I can't read the whole book to you because that would be an eight-hour task. And technically, I haven't quite given enough commentary for this to be, like, totally sanguine in copyright law, but I do hope that you'll go out and buy his book and read it because it's an amazing story. And I don't think I did it justice tonight. Maybe next year. I'm just very tired. This is why editing software is a thing and why I don't do live very often unless I'm being interviewed and hey I enjoy being interviewed so if you uh, have a channel and you want to interview me then feel free to invite me because I'll do it because I'm kind of a whore kind of like Lester like she was and that's cool all right well have a good night. I hope you enjoyed it.